on World News Tonight. Negotiation showdown. Talks intensify for the release of 17 missionaries kidnapped in Haiti. Military tensions. North Korea claims its recent test launch of missiles does not target the United States. Stricter measures. Russia's Putin orders a workplace shutdown amid a rise in COVID. Flying blind. Indoor skydiving thrills visually impaired adventurers taking a ride of a lifetime. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the updates on the Haiti kidnapping crisis. Haitian officials are yet to discover where the captured Americans are being held while talks of ransom intensify between the gang and the government. Tonight, Haiti is a country living in fear as negotiations intensify for the release of 17 kidnapped missionaries. This woman, Monique Kleska, voicing what so many here have been enduring since the assassination of the country's president in July. Haiti's justice minister telling the abductors demanded $1 million per person. Experts say it's likely the gang, known as 400 Mooso, would negotiate a lower price for anyone willing to pay. The Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries barely escaped another attack in 2019, later writing about the harrowing experience. We rounded the turn toward the airport, and a masked man dressed fully in black stopped the truck, shouting the only words he knew in broken English, money, 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 I'm hungry. Someone pulled a knife. The men tried to cut the truck tires, but failed. The missionaries managed to get away, writing one thing we do know is that we were protected by a strength much greater than man. He didn't bring everybody. David Wine is a missionary from Florida who runs an orphanage outside Port-au-Prince. We have some breaking news tonight. Barbados has elected its first ever president as it prepares to become a republic, removing Queen Elizabeth as head of state. Dame Sandra is set to be sworn in on the 30th of November, which will mark the country's 55th anniversary of the independence from Britain. The first woman to serve on the Barbados Court of Appeals, Dame Mason, has been Governor General since 2018. The government announced the plan to move to a republic status last year. Jamaica has in the past suggested that it might also consider the change. North Korea claims its recent missile launch was not directed at the United States, instead expressing concerns over movements by the international community. North Korea says its test launch of a SLBM this week is not directed at the U.S., saying it had been pre-planned long ago for the regime's national defense and there is no need for the U.S. to be worried. Its central news agency reported Thursday that the North Foreign Ministry officials said there would be no tensions on the Korean Peninsula if they are not bothered for exercising its sovereignty. The official pointed to a double standard from the U.S. who criticized development of the same weapons that the U.S. already owns or develops. The officials that the regime has already expressed deep concerns over a U.N. Security Council meeting. The United Nations reportedly convened an emergency closed-door meeting on Wednesday at the request of the U.S. and Britain regarding the North missile launch. Ahead of the U.N. Security Council meeting on Wednesday, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield urged North Korea to refrain from further provocations and engage in sustained and substantive dialogues for the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. She reiterated that the U.S. has offered to meet North Korean officials without any preconditions and that Washington has no hostile intent toward the regime. The American diplomat called a series of missile launches illegal and unacceptable, calling on the North to abide by Security Council resolutions. Other European countries, including Ireland, France and Estonia, strongly condemned the North's launch of the ballistic missile, saying it amounts to a violation of UN Security Council resolutions. They also called on the international community to strictly maintain sanctions against the regime. France will announce potential sanctions over energy prices and trade while bracing for possible sanctions against Britain in the fishing row as well. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratan reporting from Normandy in France. For more, Chetana. Yes, Shanali. French government spokesperson Gabriel Attel said France could announce possible retaliatory measures in its fishing dispute with Britain by the end of the week. Attel said 
a news conference following a meeting of the French cabinet that the government is positioning itself to take measures. Paris is infuriated by London's refusal to grant what it considers the full number of licenses due to French fishing boats to operate in Britain's ter territorial waters and is threatening relatory measures. Attel said the sanctions, which could include tariffs on energy and restrictions to, for access to ports, could take effect sometime in November if Britain decides not to respect the agreement that was signed. French fishermen have also said they could block the northern port of Calais and Channel Tunnel Rail Link, both major transit points for trade between Britain and continental Europe, if London does not grant more fishing license. Back to you, Shanoi. All right, thank you. That was Adderanobolni, Special Correspondent Chetan Adharma Ratna, reporting from Normandy in France. Britain and New Zealand have reached agreement in principle on free trade deal designed to reduce tariffs, improve services trade and take London one step closer to membership of a broader Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. For more on this, let's cross over to other there in a world new special correspondent Dilini Senvi Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. Dilini. Yes, Shanali. Prime Ministers Boris Johnson and Jacinda Ardern sealed the deal in a Zoom call after 16 months of negotiation. It comes only months after a similar British agreement with Australia as ministers in London look to flesh out a post-Brexit pivot away from relying on commerce with the European Union. The deal cuts goods tariffs, improves access for services and eases movement restrictions for professionals. It also fully opens up the British market to lamb imports from New Zealand which upset Britain's farmers. The deal took longer to reach than expected, coming nearly two months after a target date and was criticised by Britain's opposition Labour Party as harming farmers and failing to deliver on jobs, exports or economic growth. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidara Naval News Special Correspondent Dilini Senvi Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. Ethiopian government airstrikes hit the capital of northern Tigray region, the third such attack this week in a stepped-up campaign to weaken rebellious Tigray forces in an almost one-year-old war. Ethiopia launched its third airstrike in a week on the capital of Tigray on Wednesday, as it steps up its campaign to try and weaken forces loyal to the northern region's ruling party. Tigray Television, which is controlled by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, said the strike hit the city centre in Mekele. Two witnesses and a humanitarian source in Mekele say the strike appeared to be aimed at a major factory complex. The Ethiopian government said it had targeted buildings where Tigrayan forces were repairing armaments. Fighting in the nearly year-old conflict is intensifying. Having recaptured Mekele and much of Tigray several months ago, the TPLF pushed into the neighbouring Amhara and Afar regions in July. Last week, the TPLF said the government had started an offensive in Amhara. The military said it was inflicting heavy casualties and that the TPLF had opened war on all fronts. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. We have some good news for you. Anglo-Australian miner Rio Tinto announced a $7.5 billion plan to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, which is thrice as large as the previously planned emission cuts, leading other competitors to feel the pressure. Mining giant Rio Tinto is set to spend $7.5 billion to cut its emissions in half by 2030. The reduction is three times greater than its previous target, but shares fell as investors reacted to the higher spend. The Anglo-Australian miner brought forward to 2025 its target for a 15% reduction in emissions from 2018 levels, five years faster than it had previously planned. To meet its goal, Rio will increase the amount of power it gets from renewables, boost research and development spending, and also double spending on growth in minerals critical to the energy transition. It did not, however, commit to bigger reductions for its customer emissions, currently targeted at 30% by the end of the decade. 
Rio's plans blow past those of rival BHP, which targets reducing its operational emissions by 30% by 2030, but still falls short of Fortescue Metals Group's goals. It committed earlier this month to achieve net zero emissions by 2040. Now moving on to the updates of the COVID crisis, the Biden administration outlined big plans to vaccinate children from age groups of 5 to 11 years across the United States. Depending on the authorization of the jabs by the FDA, readying doses and preparing locations ahead of the busy holiday season. The Biden administration on Wednesday outlined its plan to vaccinate millions of kids ages 5 to 11 as soon as the COVID-19 shot is approved for younger children. Like these sisters who recently took part in a vaccine trial at Duke University, great, kids will get their shots at clinics in more than 100 children hospital systems nationwide, as well as doctors' offices, pharmacies, and potentially schools, the White House said, as it readies doses ahead of the busy holiday season. White House COVID-19 response coordinator Jeff Zients said the new vaccination campaign would be tailored for children. Kids have different needs than adults, and our operational planning is geared to meet those specific needs, including by offering vaccinations in settings that parents and kids are familiar with and trust. He also said the administration had worked with Pfizer to modify the packaging of the pediatric doses to make it easier to administer to children, including providing smaller needles. Food and Drug Administration officials are reviewing the Pfizer-BioNTech application seeking approval of its two-dose vaccine for younger children, with its panel of outside advisors scheduled to weigh in on October 26th. The FDA typically follows the advice of its panel, but is not required to do so. Advisors to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will next weigh in on recommendations for the vaccine at a November 2nd and 3rd meeting. Once approved, roughly 28 million more children in the United States would be eligible to receive what would be the first U.S.-approved vaccine to ward off the novel coronavirus in younger kids. The Pfizer-BioNTech shot is already approved for those ages 12 to 17, and the companies are still studying it for those younger than five. President Vladimir Putin has authorized a plan to close down workplaces across Russia for one week to battle the exponential rise in COVID infections throughout the country. The Russian government is putting strict measures in place to combat a spike in COVID-19 cases and deaths. President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday approved a proposal for a week-long workplace shutdown at the start of November. Putin said the non-working days from October 30th to November 7th, during which people would continue to receive salaries, could start or stop at different times for certain regions. This comes as coronavirus-related deaths across Russia hit another daily record at 1,028, with over 34,000 new infections in the past 24 hours. On Tuesday, Moscow's mayor announced four months of stay-at-home measures for unvaccinated people over the age of 60. In the face of a strained health care system, authorities are stressing urgency in their efforts to slow the spread of the virus and confront public reluctance to get inoculated with the Russian-made vaccine. Russia began a revaccination campaign in July, one of the first countries to do so. Even so, Putin himself has yet to receive a booster shot, according to the Kremlin. A Brazilian Senate committee recommended that President Jair Bolsonaro faces at least 10 charges, including crimes against humanity and over his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Jair Bolsonaro committed intentional crimes in his management of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's the conclusion of a six-month Senate inquiry, which makes damning accusations against the Brazilian president. The report recommends Bolsonaro be indicted on 10 charges. They include crimes against humanity, misuse of public funds and prevarication, meaning delaying necessary action for reasons of personal interest. Senators had previously recommended the charges of homicide and genocide, but those were withdrawn last minute. The pandemic has killed more than 600,000 people in Brazil, the world's second highest death toll from the virus. The inquiry investigated several topics, including Bolsonaro's anti-lockdown speeches, the crippling lack of oxygen in the northern city of Manaus, and delays in buying vaccines. The work of this Senate inquiry committee revealed that the acquisition of immunizers was not a priority. 
In response, the president said the Senate hearings were a waste of time. We know that we are guilty of absolutely nothing. We know that we did the right thing from the very first moment. There's no guarantee the reports will lead to criminal charges, which would have to be brought by Brazil's prosecutor general, whom Bolsonaro appointed. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Netflix staff members, transgender rights advocates and public officials gathered near the streaming giant's Los Angeles headquarters in protest of comedian Dave Schaffel's new special, The Closer. The FBI said a notebook and a backpack belonging to Brian Laundrie, the fiancé of Gabby Petito, along with what appeared to be human remains were found in an area at the environmental park in Florida. The UN refugee agency UNHRC said more than 700,000 people have been affected by flooding in South Sudan, blaming climate change change for the worst floods in some parts of the African country in nearly 60 years. Britain's Queen Elizabeth, the world's longest reigning monarch, decided to rest for the next few days on advice from doctors and cancelled a planned visit to Northern Ireland. Three days of heavy rain have triggered landslides and flash floods in Nepal, killing dozens of people and at least 30 are missing. Hundreds of Nigerians took to the streets of Lagos to mark the one-year anniversary of the NSAS protests. Facebook has settled to pay over $14 million in the latest civil lawsuit against the company in which it was accused to have discriminated against workers and have violated worker rules. Facebook Inc. has agreed to pay up to $14.25 million to settle civil claims by the U.S. government that the social media company discriminated against American workers and violated federal recruitment rules. The Justice Department last December filed a lawsuit that Facebook gave hiring preferences to temporary workers, including those who hold H-1B visas that let companies temporarily employ foreign workers in certain specialty occupations. Such visas are widely used by tech companies. The U.S. government said Facebook refused to recruit or hire U.S. workers for jobs that had been reserved for temporary visa holders. Facebook will pay a civil penalty of $4.75 million plus up to $9.5 million to eligible victims of what the government called discriminatory hiring practices. While it sounds like pocket change for Facebook, Kristen Clark, Assistant U.S. Attorney General for the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, called the agreement historic, saying it's the largest civil penalty ever in the 35-year history of the Immigration and Nationality Act's anti-discrimination provision. The settlements come at a time when Facebook is facing increasing U.S. government scrutiny. Facebook this month faced anger from U.S. lawmakers after former company employee and whistleblower Francis Haugen accused it of pushing for higher profits while being cavalier about user safety, saying the company has knowingly allowed its platforms to harm children's mental health and stoke societal divisions. The company has denied any wrongdoing. And finally tonight, a group of thrill seekers who are blind or visually impaired took to the air to try their hands on indoor skydiving in a Barcelona wind tunnel. Participants said that they were overjoyed by the experience and the sense of freedom they felt as they flew in the wind tunnel alongside an instructor. Participants said that it felt like being in a pool of air or water while being able to breathe or in other words feeling completely free. Other participants said the sport was accessible to people with disabilities and was something they felt they could do on their own with some practice. The high-flying adventure was part of the Handyfly project which started in 2016 and aims to bring parachuting and indoor skydiving to people with disabilities. The event was hosted by indoor flight company Window in Barcelona and done in a conjunction with the European Commission and the ONCE which benefits people who are visually impaired. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.